Um, this is an important topic uh, for sportsmen and women, for habitat, uh, for conservation. Um, seems like we talk about this this topic year in, year out. When the fires start burning in the West in particular, then it really becomes something. But I uh, want to really thank the Resources Committee for taking a really proactive lead on trying to uh, hopefully get ahead of some of this. Um, uh, it is my pleasure to introduce uh, our two caucus chairs here real quickly, uh, and then we do have the chairman of the committee and the chairman of the subcommittee uh, of jurisdiction. So, uh, but as we typically do, it's a bipartisan caucus, and today we have uh, Congressman Rob Whitman with us here from Virginia, and Congressman Gene Green from Texas. Gentlemen, do you want to come up? Thank you for being here. Well, Jeff, thank you. Good morning. I'm here with Gene Green, uh, the co-chairman here of the caucus. Thank you all so much for coming out this morning. This Forest Resiliency Act is a very, very important aspect of how do we make sure we're maintaining habitats, how do we make sure we are managing our forests properly to ensure that we have that diversity of habitat that we need. I want to thank our, our chairman here from the Resources Committee that I have the honor of serving on, Chairman Rob Bishop. Chairman Bishop, thank you so much for what you do. Also, our subcommittee chairman, Tom McClintock. Tom, thanks so much for your leadership here. So, Jeff, thanks. And I'm going to turn it over to uh, to Gene Green, our co-chair there on the Congressional Sportsman's Conference. Thank you, Rob. One, I want to thank everyone for being here, just like Rob said. And, and this is a special part of uh, the caucus briefings over the next number of months on the Forest Resiliency Act. You know, we're putting together a piece of legislation that our goal is to get it on the president's desk and get it signed. And this is part of it. Uh, and you know, on a personal note, uh, I actually bought some land north of Houston so my son and I could uh, go hunt back in the 70s and 80s. And, uh, and I cut the trees off of it to help pay for it. But, uh, but we needed to do that to make sure we could actually have hunting. And frankly, if I spent more time in the woods, I wouldn't have to go to my next meeting on mental health. But, uh, <laughs> uh, talk about mental health legislation. But, uh, but again, thank you for being here and thank the caucus for helping put together that piece of legislation because again, we want to make sure it passes for the House and Senate because there's so many things in there for sportsmen and outdoorsmen and hunting and fishing that it's uh, too important to let them die. So thank you, Rob. And let me introduce the members who are here. Bob Ladder, who serves with me on the Energy and Commerce Committee. Chairman Rob Bishop, uh, uh, Tom McClintock, uh, of course, Rob, and Gary Palmer. Congressman Gary Palmer in the back. Thank you for being here. My, uh, my honor to, there we go, uh, my honor to introduce the chairman of the Natural Resources Committee, uh, Congressman Rob Bishop from Utah, uh, who has already helped us start the process on the Sportsman's Act and a number of other issues that are really near and dear to all of us, but today we're talking a little bit more about the uh, Forest Resiliency Act. Please welcome Chairman Bishop. Appreciate very much the opportunity of being here because I love nothing more than coming to the early morning meetings. Um, and I'm sorry Gene had to leave. I'm, I'm very proud he was able to buy some forest land in Texas. If we want to do the same thing in Utah, that's a bad chance. He'd have to talk to some bureaucrat from the Forest Service to have any kind of access there. Um, I appreciate this group. We'll be working with you. You mentioned the sports on but I don't want to forget that. That is still something that we will get done. One way or another, in both houses this time, we will get done. But um, <laughs> the Forest Resiliency Act, though, is also something that is extremely important to me. You are, we are entering into, as you said, the wildfire season. Um, the uniqueness of the weather in the West, I think, is going to put that off for a while, but it's just going to be just as bad when it, when it starts up, when, uh, when it starts to dry out and go forward. And yes, it needs some more money to make sure it's effective, but that alone is not going to solve the problem. We can't just throw money at this. That's not going to be it. There has to be some substantial changes. And I'm happy about the Forest Resilience Act because it is the first step forward. There's other things we're going to have to do systematically, but this is a good first step that I think can pass and can get us started down that, that way. Part of it is also, I mean, it's, it's, we make, I make fun of the, of the bureaucracy here all the time because they're such an easy target, but they're not mobile enough. Part of it is some of the handicaps in which they are faced, you know, from the, from the beginning of the Clinton administration to the end of the Bush II. There were like 1,100 1, lawsuits that the Forest Service had to face. 
And that was just the suits, not even the threat of those suits. So part of the process is not only are they stopping this effort to try and, and fix the forest, to try and make it healthier, to try and thin the forest, to try and recede the forest, not only are they stopping that, but the people on the ground are so fearful of being sued that they try and make sure everything is 100% bulletproof before they ever start down the process. That has to stop. That is probably one of the most important impediments that we have that has to stop. And this is the first step in going forward in that effort. And then also giving them some of the tools. I'll, I'll actually let McClintock, this, this is his bill as well here. He's one of the co-sponsors. What's when he comes in, you'll let him have a chance of explaining the details in it. But what I'm excited about is this bill is one that I think is possible to get passed. Not only that, it's something that could be implemented the day it's signed. They're ready to go. They have access to it. It will free them up to do some management plans. We actually had in our testimony some great language that was coming from the Forest Service in complimenting what we were attempting to do. I think that says a mindset that if we give these people the right tools, we can accomplish some good things and we can move this forward. And, and we're not done with this bill alone. There's still more to be done, but this is a great first step. I appreciate your, uh, the, this organization's support of it. I'm going to ask you to continue with that support. Because once again, getting this through the House, getting it through the Senate, getting the President to sign it, I think those will require some efforts to let people know this is good stuff and we need to go forward. I expect this thing to be passed on the floor in July. I expect to bring it up in July. I expect to be passing over in the Senate so we can start continuing that process. Once again, your efforts to try and help us with lobbying towards that goal would be extremely helpful, and I uh, welcome your participation. As I also want to know how much I appreciate all the participation you've done in the past, everything you have done for us. Um, thank you. I hope, I hope we can continue this partnership and actually do some good stuff. With that, thank you for allowing me to be here. I appreciate it. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, as you pointed out, your sub sorry about that, folks. Your subcommittee chair uh, is also here from the land subcommittee. Um, I got the privilege of testifying on the Sportsman's Act uh, uh, in front of his committee, and uh, so again, I don't mean to be harping on that, but just kind of yeah. subliminally throwing that out there once in a while, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Chairman. Please welcome uh, Congressman and Chairman Tom McClintock. Thank you very much. Let me speak a little more expansively about our, our federal lands policies. Uh, this is obviously a first step, but only a first step in restoring the vision of the founders of the national parks and forests. You go back to Norman and Plantagenet in England, you'll find the uh, uh, crown setting aside one third of the acreage of uh, England uh, as the king's forests. Uh, there, no commoner could tread, uh, uh, access was severely restricted, uh, you weren't allowed to take game, you weren't allowed to collect firewood, uh, you weren't allowed access uh, under, under very, very uh, serious terms. Um, the American national parks and forests and other public lands were set aside to be exactly the opposite. These were to be the forests and the public lands of the American people. In the words of the uh, Charter for Yosemite, the first of our national parks, uh, it was to be set aside for public use, resort, and recreation for all time. Uh, that was the purpose of setting aside these vast tracts of public lands, uh, and they were managed and managed well. Uh, not only to be uh, uh, preserved for future generations, but also to be of use, resort, and recreation in the current generation. The visionaries who founded our public lands uh, policies understood that s preserving these lands for future generations did not mean closing them to the current generation. But about 30 years ago, 40 years ago now, a radical and retrograde ideology began seeping into our public policy. Uh, and what it has done is to replace that vision of Gifford, Pinchot, and John Muir to open the public lands to the American people, instead to, uh, to remove the public from the public lands. Uh, the idea was uh, it can basically described as, as look but don't touch. Well, for 40 years now, these policies have dominated our public lands management. Uh, the uh, uh, environmental left uh, has had free reign over our uh, laws, our policies, our litigation, and our policy makers. And 
as we look back on these past 40 years, we can see that not only have they done enormous damage to our economy, enormous damage to the whole concept of the public lands, but they've also done enormous damage to the environment as well. Uh, in the past uh, uh, 30 years, we've seen an 80% decline in the timber harvest uh, out of our national forests. And in that same period, we've seen a concomitant increase uh, in uh, acreage destroyed by fire. Uh, all of that excess timber comes out of the forest one way or another. It, it either is carried out or it is burned out, but it comes out. When we carried it out, we had a thriving economy and we had healthy forests that had plenty of room to grow, that were resistant to pestilence and uh, fire and disease. And in these 40 years of what can only be described as benign neglect, uh, we have seen the forests become horribly overgrown. Uh, trees now fighting for their lives in competition with other trees, trying to occupy the same ground. Uh, and in that stress condition, they have fallen victim to massive catastrophic wildfires as well as uh, losing entire tracts of forest uh, to uh, pestilence uh, and to disease. I think we are finally turning a corner, and this measure is the first step in that road back to sound forest management practices, that road back to the public's right to use the public lands for use, resort, and recreation for all time. In my district, I have five national forests. I represent the uh, basically the Sierra Nevada uh, in California. Um, in those uh, five national forests and two national parks, in the last two years, uh, we saw the Rim Fire destroy more than 400 square miles of national forest. And we saw the King Fire destroy 150 square miles and came very, very close to wiping out two entire communities. And on the day they thought they were going to lose those communities, in Forest Hill and Georgetown, I was at the command center for the fire and the most bitter complaint that the uh, firefighters had, uh, one of them with tears in his eyes coming up and saying, we can't get to the fire on the ground anymore. We used to have good roads, we could get to these fires. Uh, they've all been abandoned. We can't get to them anymore. And if the winds hadn't shifted, we would have lost two entire communities in our district. Uh, that's unacceptable. Well, in the aftermath of those fires, uh, we've now uh, uh, watched the sad saga uh, of um, how timber salvage has also been even restricted by these. Uh, we have about 16,000 acres on the rim fire that's owned privately. It's not subject to all of these idiotic restrictions. Within a year, uh, the owner had completely harvested the dead timber, uh, used a portion of those proceeds to begin replanting uh, uh, those forest lands. And within a couple of years, those 16,000 uh, acres of private forest land will once again be healthy, thriving, green, growing young forests. Meanwhile, in the year that the private landowner was completely salvaging his properties, uh, the federal government was still in environmental studies. Uh, they are going to uh, salvage only a tiny fraction of the dead timber. As you know, uh, in any fire, uh, uh, brush has first call on, uh, on timberland. Uh, within a couple of years, as the private lands are thriving and green and growing, we will watch 400 square miles of public lands become overgrown with scrub brush, and then the dead, dry trees that were never salvaged uh, will start toppling on top of them, and we'll have a perfect fire stack for a second generation fire that can be uh, assured to absolutely uh, uh, devastate that region. Um, but we will have a contrast between sound forest management practices public, practiced on the private lands uh, and the idiotic regulations that have consigned our public lands to benign neglect. At that point, I think we would be entitled to, to ask the question, if these, you know, why is it that the private lands under uh, uh, sound management can be so well managed and our public lands so badly managed? This, again, is just a first step, uh, among other things, it allows a categorical exemption from uh, NEPA for 5,000 uh, acres of timber salvage. Uh, the problem is the rim fire was 255,000 acres, but it is a first step, and I think once we're able to take this step, many more will follow, and we'll be able to look back 40 years from now 
on the restoration of sound forest management. We'll be again looking at healthy, thriving forests and an American public that is guaranteed their use, resort, and recreation for all time. Thank you all for everything you're doing in this call. Came in. Thank you, sir, for being here. Uh, it's now my privilege to introduce the uh, sponsor of the bill, uh, and he is a graduate of the Yale Forestry School. And for those of you that remember your history, the first chief of the Forest Service was also a graduate of the Yale Forestry School, different pin show. So, um, got some street cred uh, from the program uh, from 100 years, and so uh, please welcome. Congressman Bruce Westerman. Thank you. It's so good to, uh, to be here this morning and to talk about such a, an interesting subject and one that's near and dear to me. I'm not sure if uh, being a graduate of the Yale School of Forestry gets you street cred or creates more suspicion, but uh, <laughs> I did attend there and uh, Gifford Pinchot did found the Yale School of Forestry. Uh, the story goes that when the, uh, the National Forests were first created, that uh, Teddy Roosevelt and Gifford Pinchot laid out the maps on the floor of the Oval Office and actually sketched them out uh, by hand. Um, <clears throat> there must not have been near as much bureaucracy back, back in that time. This is something, the, uh, the Brazilian Federal Forest Act of 2015, something I'm very excited about. I'm excited about it because it's based on the science of forestry management. And the, the problem we've had in this country over the past several decades is we've, we've literally loved our trees to death. Um, we've loved them so much that we've quit managing them. And the, the point that I've tried to make over and over is that trees don't listen to the policy that we make here. Trees are dynamic, living organisms. Uh, we can make whatever policy we want to make. If they're going to continue growing, they're going to fill up the growing space. Then they're going to stop growing. They're going to get old and weak and, and start dying and create more hazards for insects and fire and, and disease. <clears throat> and that's what, what we're seeing. We're seeing the results of no management. And one of the things that I'm really pleased about in this bill is that we've got a provision in there that when a management plan is presented, we not only have to present uh, the, the cost and benefits of that management plan, but we have to look at a no action alternative. Because again, with force, no action is an action. You cannot choose to not manage force because anyway, any decision you make is a management decision. We've got that in the bill. We've got um, uh, things in the bill that will help uh, prevent wildfires. You know, when you think about fires, there are two areas. You've got prevention and suppression. Uh, we're all the only thing we're really doing right now is suppression. Suppression is extremely expensive. You've got. A loss of public property, you've got loss of private property. When fires happen, we all know that uh, they do more damage than just the damage on the on the public forest. <coughs> um, now this is uh, this particular type of, of management that's being pushed here: the sound management of um, clearing out underbrush, allowing the healthy trees to thrive. It's something that I first saw around 2000. And interestingly, it was put in place in the south because of the, the great cockaded woodpecker. And the, the woodpecker's habitat was, uh, was, there wasn't as much of it, the numbers were declining. So foresters went out, a lot of it on private land, and they started um, mainly in the Gulf Coast managing longleaf pine and wire stem grass to create better habitat for the red cockaded woodpecker. Well, longleaf pine is a, is a fire prone species. It, uh, it loves to have fire, it actually needs fire to regenerate and, and be healthy. And uh, it creates this beautiful forest habitat when you uh, clear out the underbrush, manage the, the timber, and use a, a two to three year fire interval uh, to keep the fires down. And, and when you get a fire in one of these stands of timber, it just, the fire goes through it really quickly. It does, do, it does hardly any damage, but you, then you get this flush of growth coming back on the forest, what we call the early successional habitat. It's great for wildlife. Not only did we see species of very cockaded woodpecker increasing, we also saw uh, wild turkey, deer, and, and all the other wildlife and uh, songbirds that uh, like that type of habitat. <coughs> in my state of Arkansas, we've got two national forests. Uh, most of it is in uh, my district, the Washtenaw National Forest and the Ozark National Forest. 
and also uh, in response to the red cockaded woodpecker, uh, the Forest Service began doing the shortleaf pine blue stem grass uh, ecosystem restoration. And again, these forests were, were overgrown. As I, when I was growing up as a kid, uh, my view of what the forest was is, is totally different from how uh, the forest had been managed for uh, for a long, long time. And actually, the earliest explorers that came through Arkansas said that you could ride a horse at full gate through the Ouachita National Forest. If you try to run ride a horse at full gate through the Ouachita National Forest right now, you'd probably kill both yourself and the horse. Um, but these areas where they've gone in and put in this short leaf pine blue stem grass restoration project, it, it has created uh, an area where it's, it's open. You've got a lot of early successional habitats. You've got mature trees that provide good ha um, nesting habitat for woodpeckers. And you get all kinds of uh, external benefits from this. Um, in forestry, we always say trees are the answer. And you can't tell me any problem that we talk about environmentally today where trees aren't the answer. If you, uh, if you want to talk about carbon, trees sequester carbon. It's just the natural photosynthetic process that uh, trees pull carbon dioxide out of the air and they put oxygen back in. When we cut trees down and we make lumber and plywood and we put them in homes or buildings, we're sequestering carbon in the, those trees. New trees grow up. Uh, the younger the tree, the, the faster it grows and the more carbon it pulls out of the air. So there's a huge benefit uh, on the carbon side of things with trees. Uh, when you look at clean water, uh, trees play a vital important part of, of keeping water clean in the watershed. Trees provide wildlife habitat. Um, and there's really not a downside that I've ever been able to find with a healthy forest. But what we've been uh, promoting through non-management across our national forest are unhealthy forests, and we see the, the destruction and the bad things that go along with that. Um, the collaborative effort projects that are outlined in this bill are, are great. I've always believed that government's more effective when it's closest to the people. This is a great example of it where people who live in an area form these collaborative groups. They go in and they talk about all the multiple uses of the forest, how to uh, uh, make those forests healthier, how to meet the needs of that particular community. And, and really that's the way I think our federal forest should be managed. It's implementing sound science, but we've seen issues where these plans have been put out and uh, fruitless lawsuits are filed and they stop the management plans on the forest. And again, we have unhealthy forests that aren't really good for anybody as a result of that. For the issue to require a bond, uh, if you want to file a lawsuit against the collaborative plan that's been uh, made on forest management, I think will help to slow down the frivolous lawsuits that will promote better management and again promote a uh, healthier forest. So everything that's, that's in this bill is about making our forests more healthy. It's about untying the hands of trained forestry professionals that know what needs to be done. I've heard the frustration from uh, these folks from across the country where they, they see uh, they see what needs to be done, they can write down what needs to be done, but at the end of the day, they're not able to do what needs to be done. And this bill is the first step in allowing our forestry professionals to do what needs to be done. And as a result of that, we will all benefit. We'll benefit environmentally, we'll benefit uh, physically, we'll benefit um, as, as outdoorsmen. Um, and again, it's just a win-win-win situation. So. I can't say thank you enough to Chairman Bishop for allowing me to be involved uh, at this level on this bill, for uh, Chairman McClintock on the, the Federal Land Subcommittee uh, for letting me uh, do something I really love to do, and that's work with, with trees and policy about forest management. So I'm excited about it. I've got a lot of uh, very positive feedback from across the country. I appreciate all the uh, the different groups that have come out and recognize that sound science and good management is really good for, for everyone. And uh, I just appreciate uh, all the support and look forward as we move this bill forward and get even more support. And at the end of the day, really make a difference for public lands and forestry all across the country. Thank you, Congressman. Uh, I want to recognize Congressman Robert Hull. Thank you for stopping by as well. Um, we're going to keep moving. Our program is, is moving right along. Uh, we are expecting Congresswoman Kirkpatrick, and uh, if she arrives, then hopefully we can work her into the program. But 
Uh, I'd like to now recognize uh, the staff director for the subcommittee uh, on lands, who's a good, great friend of this community, because she used to be part, and still is part, but used to work in the community, um, and has been involved in these issues for many years. Please welcome Erica Rowe. Good morning. Um, let me tell you how much fun it is to give a presentation in front of my bosses sitting here in the front row. So, <laughs> um, I wanted to talk a little bit about the problem today to put this in perspective. Right now we know that at a bare minimum we have 58 million acres at high risk to catastrophic wildfire. We know that this year the Forest Service is expecting to treat roughly 3 million acres. Many of these acres are actually double counted by the agency, but we won't even go there. We'll um, instead pretend that they're actually treating 3 million acres. That means it would take 20 years, a minimum of 20 years, to get ahead of this problem. Since 2003, 76.6 million acres have burned in catastrophic wildfires, and on average, the Forest Service only reforests about 3% of the area that is burned. Uh, we know that our national forests are impacted by other events such as ice storms, uh, hurricanes, blowdowns, windstorms. And we also know that uh, habitat for early cereal species is uh, lacking in our national forests and across the country, honestly. These are species such as uh, wild turkey, rough grouse, elk, and deer. <coughs> We also know that the Forest Service and BLM, this bill does address BLM as well, they have some authorities to address these problems, but we heard through testimony and hearings that these authorities are too specific. So for example, through the Healthy Forest Restoration Act, which was passed in 2003, we focused mainly on fire prevention. In the Farm Bill, the 2014 Farm Bill, we focused mainly on insects and disease. So this made it difficult for the Forest Service or BLM to do a project that would be combining insects and disease, wildlife habitat improvements, and reducing, reducing hazardous fuels. So as a result of this, we decided to design three large categorical exclusions that would impact all of these problems. The first being addressing forest health, uh, wildlife habitat, and hazardous fuels. The second being creating early seral habitat. And the third being uh, allowing for quick salvage and reforestation after wildfire and other catastrophic events. Uh, this bill does not solve all the problems uh, that the BLM and the Forest Service have. As the chairman said, this is just the first step in the right direction. But it will uh, give the agencies the tools they need to act quickly. Uh, for example, right now, an EIS, which is required for any large project on national forests, takes 37 months to complete. That's before they can even start doing any work on the ground. The average environmental assessment takes 19 months, and the average categorical exclusion takes six months. So in this case, we're going the six-month route. Um, this will allow the agencies to treat many more acres at much less of a cost. We're also opening up in this bill sources of funding that already exist and freeing up those funds so they can be used by the Forest Service and BLM for forest management. The other great thing about this bill is that it applies to the entire United States. Um, many of our bills are focused on wildfire but this bill will actually benefit forests that are in the Northeast, the Lake States, and the Southeast, not just the West. Uh, there are still plenty of environmental safeguards in this bill. NEPA is still required. Uh, categorical exclusions are part of NEPA, and there's still an environmental review process, and all other laws still apply. Uh, there are also, the, the authorities in this bill are also based off of forest and resource management plans. So the national forests are required to do a forest plan for each national forest. These are a very long, cumbersome process over many years. Uh, forest plans can be litigated. They have 
rigorous public uh, involvement requirements, and we base everything in this bill off of those forest plans. Uh, and also, the bonding was very important um, for folks like Mr. Um, Representative Zinke from Montana. He has had numerous collaborative projects in his state that have been litigated. So we do require bonding uh, for would-be litigants on collaborative projects in this bill. Uh, the bonding requirement is only for the time and resources it would take for the agencies to respond to litigation. And we're hoping this will be the first step in discouraging litigation. There have also been a lot of outrageous claims about this bill that I just wanted to quickly address. One is that there will be eight square mile clear cuts in this bill. As I stated before, this is all based off of forest plans. Forest plans don't allow for eight square mile clear cuts. Um, they have standards and guidelines that dictate how harvests um, must take place. Uh, still, the Clean Water Act, all of those type of protected laws apply. And uh, in addition to that, most states would not also allow, um, with their State Forest Practices Act, an eight square mile clear cut. Um, new road building. We do allow for temporary roads for salvage and reforestation, but we require that those roads be decommissioned at the completion of reforestation. We've also been criticized because the categorical exclusions of this bill are too large, saying they're four times or five times what is currently allowed. Given the scope and the size of the problem, we think that uh, this is just a drop in the bucket of what actually needs to happen to address the problem. Uh, and finally, there's also been charges that this would allow for salvage logging in the wilderness. And this is simply not the case. There's language in the bill that prohibits it, these authorities from being used in wilderness or any other area that is congressionally um, dictated to not be, uh, not allow the harvest of timber. So with that, uh, I just wanted to say thank you. Many of you in the room have written letters of support and have reached out uh, to members about our bill, and we greatly appreciate your efforts. Um, we ask you to continue doing this. Um, as the chairman referenced, we're planning to go to the floor before August recess, so we need to keep the momentum and ask you to continue reaching out uh, and asking for support of our bill. Thank you. So the Congressional Sportsman's Foundation gets to have the great privilege of being a liaison between the, the caucus and, and the members here uh, that are champion in this. But we also are part of a broader group of conservationists, sportsmen and women, called the American Wildlife Conservation Partners, uh, which is 50 of the leading sportsmen's groups uh, around the country. Uh, four of them are here supporting this breakfast this morning. Please give a round of applause for the Boone and Crockett Club, the National Wild Turkey Federation, Rocky Mountain Health Foundation, and the Rough Grouse Society. Thank you for placing us with us. It's now my privilege to um, introduce um, from the National Wild Turkey Federation, who also happens to be our chairman uh, for the American Wildlife Conservation Partners for 2015, uh, a biologist also by training, uh, and talk a little bit about some of the aspects of this bill. Um, please welcome Joel Pedersen. Well, thank you. It is a pleasure to be here today. Um, thank everybody for the work that's been done on this. Thank you for the introduction of the bill and, and all the great work on that. Um, as Jeff said, I am a certified wildlife biologist, uh, work for the National Wild Turkey Federation. I'm the Director of Lands and Policy for the NWTF right now. For those of you that don't know a lot about the NWTF, uh, we're a national nonprofit organization with about 230,000 members across the nation. Uh, and
All right, bat and cleanup for us today. Uh, another wildlife biologist from Wisconsin. Uh, if you ever get the chance to hunt with Dan Desiker, he's got fantastic dogs up there. So uh, I'm giving you that as, as a great introduction. And since we're pushing up on the, the time, Dan, thanks for being here. Please welcome Dan Desiker from Rough Grass Society. Thank you, Jeff. And it is, of course, the responsibility of the final speaker to be brief, and I will meet that charge. Um, in order to maintain the full array of forest wildlife in our national forest, we have to maintain the full array of forest wildlife habitats. Young, old, and everything in between. Now, over the past decade, uh, national forests in regions eight to nine, on average, the forests have met 24% of their minimum goal identified in the forest plan for young forest habitats. Minimum goal. That affects wildlife and it affects sportsmen and women. White-tailed deer in the eastern United States are declining on many national forests and many states have said, hey, help us out here. This is not just critters. This is the economy of rural communities. White-tailed deer hunting has a huge impact on many, many small rural economies. Rough grouse, the species that my dog and I like. It has declined precipitously on numerous national forests in the Great Lakes states, particularly the Northeast as well. It has been virtually, if not actually, eliminated from the Chattahoochee National Forest in Georgia, the Sumter in South Carolina, and the Hoosier in Indiana. It's not just game wildlife. As Joel mentioned, 59% of the songbirds that breed in young forest habitats are declining. That's a far greater percentage than those that use mature forests. A little critter called a golden wing warbler. Beautiful little bird. Uses young forest habitat. It's been eliminated on the Cherokee National Forest of Tennessee. It's been eliminated from the Chattahoochee National Forest in Georgia. Well, actually, there was one found last month, first time in several years. Next year, the Fish and Wildlife Service is scheduled to review the status of the golden wing warbler for possible listing under the Federal Endangered Species Act. Section 104 of, of current legislation, 2647, does a great job in recognizing the role of forest wildlife management, forest management and forest wildlife conservation. It isn't forest management or wildlife. It's forest management for wildlife. And that we have to remember. It also authorizes a streamlined planning, planning process whereby we can get more work done on the ground in a more timely and more efficient fashion. This single element of the legislation would, I think, help reverse some of the trends that we're facing with regard to the declines of young forest wildlife on our national forest. This isn't rocket science, okay? If you build young forest habitats, the critters that use them will come. If we ignore those habitats, they go away. Thanks.